Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about inheritance and composition, and this is the first new material for CS151. Uh, basically, inheritance is a process that allows you to derive one class that's called the derived class from another, which is the uh, base class. They're sometimes referred to as the superclass and the subclass. Uh, derived classes have all the features of the base class along with a few more. And when we're talking about inheritance, we can think of it as an is a relationship. So, for example, a student is a person. A King Charles Cavalier is a dog. And so that's the is a relationship that we see uh, in the uh, inheritance. So it's one of the most powerful concepts in object-oriented programming languages, and C++ in particular. And it helps us reduce software development complexity, particularly if we're building uh, larger applications. Uh, C++ itself supports both single and multiple inheritance. Single inheritance is where the derived class has a single base class or a single parent class. Uh, multiple inheritance is where the derived class has more than one uh, base class. And, you know, some people will call that uh, Franken classes. You know, for example, a date time stamp couldn't inherit from both the date class and from the time class. Uh, languages such as Java don't support multiple inheritance, but C++ does. And if you're using a language that doesn't support multiple inheritance, there are uh, workarounds for it just have to change the design. So visualizing inheritance, uh, it can basically be viewed as a tree-like hierarchical structure between the base class and the derived class. You know, we see things like this uh, in biology, you know, for uh, kingdoms and such. So, you know, a cat is a type of mammal. A dog is a type of mammal. A horse is also a type of mammal. And an elephant is a type of mammal. Under horses, you know, Clydesdale is a specialized type of horse that uh, pulls the uh, Budweiser wagon. Uh, Labrador Retriever is a specialized type of dog, and that's my dog, uh, Saguna, who is his very own uh, type of dog. He's a King Charles Cavalier. So uh, the syntax for a derived class, the way that we do this is we have, the, um, we have a colon followed by the member access specifier and the base class name. So an hourly employee in this example is a type of employee and the base class access specifier is uh, public. So uh, we need to talk about that base class access specifier and that's what we do on the next slide. So um, basically most of the time what we're gonna do is we're gonna do public. So basically the private members of the base class are inaccessible, the protected members stay protected, and the public members stay public. Uh, protected and private will have their uses for base class access specifier, and we'll get to those a little bit later. And uh, we'll talk about protected as a uh, way of going in between public and private for member variables in a uh, base class a little bit later on in the uh, lecture. So in general, a derived class inherits all the members from the parent class. The derived class does not redeclare or redefine the members inherited by the parent unless you want to change how they behave. So if they're going to behave differently in the derived class, then you need to redeclare or redefine them. Uh, you may also hear the term override, and in C++, uh, that's generally reserved for uh, virtual functions. We'll cover those a little bit later in the class. Uh, derived class can also add member variables and functions that are peculiar to the derived class. So uh, let's take a look at um, redefinition. And again, to uh, redefine a public member function, the corresponding function derived class needs to have the same name, number, and type of parameters. And so it's going to have the same signature, but it's going to behave differently in the derived class. If the derived class redefines a public member function of the base class, then to call the base class function, you need to specify the name of the base class, use the scope resolution operator, and give the function name with the appropriate parameter list. So the scope resolution operator are those two colons uh, that you'll sometimes um, see people use if they want to call things from alternate namespaces. It basically resolves what scope we're calling something from. In this case, it's the base class. So. For uh, redefinition, imagine that we have a rectangle, and a specialized type of rectangle is a box. So box type has everything that rectangle type has, but it adds an additional variable, height, and it redefines several of the member functions from uh, rectangle. 
So we would uh, calculate area differently. Uh, we would make a new um, member function for volume. We would definitely print a box differently than we print a rectangle. And you can see in the uh, lower right here that box type is basically a type of rectangle type. So, or box type is a rectangle. So redefinition versus overloading. And, you know, again, here's where we get, um, you know, a little bit of confusion with the names. And people, you know, sometimes we'll use these uh, interchangeably. So uh, let's um, see what the formal definitions are. So uh, when you list a function in derived class and change the way it operates, you're creating a redefined function. Redefined functions have the same signature. Overloaded functions have different signatures, so you can have both overloaded and redefined functions. Um, that may be a bit confusing, and you know sometimes people can turn can confuse those terms. Um, the good news is you can still invoke the base class version using the scope resolution operator, like we talked about in the last slide. So, you know, if uh, Sally is an hourly employee and we want to just print a generic check for her from the employee class, we could say Sally uh, dash H, which would be the hourly version of salary dot employee print check. And that would call the print check function from the base class, even if Sally is an hourly employee. Uh, so constructors and constructors can be a little bit tricky in inheritance. Uh, derived class and structure Derived class constructor does not directly access private members of the base class. Uh, basically, you can only directly initialize public member variables of the base class uh, because private is uh, private. And so when a derived object is clear, declared, it needs to call one of the base class constructors, which will actually be public. And a call to the base class constructor is specified in the heading of the derived class constructor definition. So here's how we would do it. Uh, you don't get those base class constructors in the descendant class, but you can still use them. So the constructor of a drive class begins by invoking the constructor of the base class. So here we have an hourly employee, uh, and we first call the employee constructor. And then we set the things that are peculiar to an hourly employee, such as wage rate and the uh, number of hours worked. And here this would be a uh, default constructor. We could also have an overloaded uh, version of this. Uh, the part after the base constructor sets the attributes for the derived class, and here we've done this in line. Uh, what you might actually want to do is uh, write a full definition for that in the uh, class definition, or the, in the full definition in the implementation file. So what if there's no call to the base class? Well, you know, what C++ is going to do is going to try to help you out, but sometimes it doesn't help you out as much as you think. It'll call a default constructor. However, it's better to be explicit as the allocation of memory um, for member variables must be done by the constructor of the base class. And if we have dynamic memory, which we're going to get to in the next section, then things get all kinds of messy. Um, and you can also have chains of inheritance. So if you have A is the parent, uh, B is the child, and C is the grandchild, um, C will call the constructor from A first before calling B. So uh, chains of inheritance are tricky. And when we get to destructors for cleaning up those memory, uh, they also get uh, a little bit tricky. So back to public and private. And uh, we're going to pay a little bit more attention to this. Um, let's look at them a little bit more in depth. Private is private. So a member variable that's private. And remember back in 150, we told you to make your member variables private and your member functions public. So parent class member functions uh, can uh, definitely uh, be used to access private members of the parent, you know, those getters and setters. Uh, but you can't directly access them outside of the class. So this code would be illegal if NetPay is a private member of employee. So, you know, net pay equal hour times wage rate. Uh, we can't do that because uh, that's a private member variable. And remember, private is private. So the subclass can't even do that for its parent. Uh, but you can still use accessor and mutator functions, such as your getters and setters, uh, to go through and do that. But 
C++ does provide you with a workaround. And basically that's protected. So protected members of a class appear private outside the class. So, you know, within application code, but they're accessible by the derived class. So, you know, basically it says, hey, my kids can do this, but uh, nobody else gets this information. So if a member variable name net pay and social security number are listed as protected, not private in the base class, then the illegal code from the previous slide suddenly becomes legal. So, you know, what do people think of protected? Well, there's a lot of different opinions and it's, uh, you know, if you're into programming languages and the philosophy behind programming languages, uh, there's some information on SIG plan that says, hey, you know, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, my personal philosophy and, you know, kind of what I advocate for uh, this class is, hey, get it working. Uh, it's more important to have uh, working code than to have the uh, code be beautiful, not work. Uh, header files for derived classes. Uh, one thing you'll need to do is you'll basically need to have some preprocessor directives. And uh, basically, you'll need to include those um, base classes, but you also don't want to compile them multiple times. So uh, to create the new derived class, include commands that specify where the base class definitions can be found. And also, you need those preprocessor directives. If not defined class name underscore H, then go ahead and define this class name uh, and if. So that means you're not mo defining things multiple times because uh, sometimes, you know, the compilers, uh, depending on which compiler you're using, can uh, get itself in a loop. Uh, another inheritance example in C++ are streams. And you've already used streams, uh, pound include IO stream, without thinking too much about them. Uh, iOS is the base class for all streams uh, with input stream and output stream as its subclasses. And then you can have things like input file stream and uh, output file stream that are subclasses as, of those input and output streams. Uh, composition is something that's closely uh, related to inheritance, and this is a uh, piece by Mondrian that is indeed a uh, composition. And if you like Mondrian's artwork, there's actually an esoteric uh, programming language called PA that allows you to make programs visually that look like his artwork and then compile and run them. Uh, and that's going to be beyond the scope of uh, CS151. But if you're interested in that type of thing, we do discuss it in CS450. And I think last time I taught the class, I had students make their very own artistic compositions. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. So composition is not an is a relationship, it's a has a relationship. So for example, a textbook has chapters, a person has a head, a hand, and a leg. So if we're making a person, what we need to do is we need to make the parts first. So we need to make the head, the hand, and the leg, and then we can put together a person. Obviously, a person has more body parts than that, but um, you know we're keeping it so it fits on one slide. Um, and so arguments to the constructor of the member object are specified in the heading part of the definition of the constructor. Uh, member objects of a class are constructed in the order they're declared and not in the order listed in the constructor's member initialization list. So the uh, subparts are constructed before the containing class. So you basically make the parts before the whole, and that's the thing you need to remember with uh, composition. Object-oriented design is another important part of the uh, discussion, and basically it's one of the reasons that we use object-oriented programming, uh, because it's very powerful for simulating and modeling the uh, real world and making more complex programs. So three fundamental principles of object-oriented design are encapsulation, which combines the data and the operations on the data into a single unit, that is the class. Uh, inheritance, that so we just talked about creating new objects from existing objects. And polymorphism, which is the ability to use the same expression to denote different operations. And we're going to get to polymorphism a little bit later on in the class. So um, we'll just hold on to that thought for now. Uh, so in object-oriented design, the object is a fundamental entity. We debug at the class level. We get those classes bulletproof and working, and then we can put those uh, classes into the overall code. 
And this encourages code reuse. So, you know, if you're making a program that has a character and you uh, put together a really good character class uh, and you want to make a SQL for it, uh, you can reuse that character class in the uh, SQL. So you don't have to develop it from scratch each time. And C++ supports object-oriented programming through the use of classes. Uh, function names and operators can be overloaded, and a polymorphic function or operator has many forms. So, for example, polymorphism, division with floating point, and division with integer operands. So we saw the difference uh, with that in C++ before. Uh, identifying classes, the author uses a noun phrase approach to identify all the nouns as classes and verbs as potential methods or member functions within the uh, class or the operations. Uh, another approach is the class name, responsibility, and collaborator approach where you basically put down the class name as you discover it, what are its responsibilities, and what are its uh, collaborators. And this one's really kind of neat because it's interactive and tactile in that you can make these cards and you know put them on a wall and move them around to show the different relationships. So CRC approach uh, has its uses as well. And there, in fact, there's a whole host of approaches that you'll see in software engineering. So let's take a look at the noun phrase approach. Uh, suppose we have our problem that says, uh, write a program to input the dimensions of a cylinder and calculate and print the surface area and volume. So what we do is we bold the nouns and make the verbs italic, or, you know, we could use uh, different colors. And from the uh, list of nouns, we can, you know, find a candidate class, which would be a cylinder. Or uh, Malik likes to use the word type after the uh, name of the uh, class, so cylinder type uh, would be the uh, one that he would uh, use. And then the dimensions would be the attributes or the member of variables, um, you know, such as surface area and volume, and input, calculate, and print would be the things that it could do. So uh, if it's a characteristic, then it becomes a member at a member variable, and if it's a verb, it becomes a member function or a method for the class. So for the cylinder type, the uh, verbs, the operations that it can perform are get input, calculate, and print, and the uh, dimensions of the cylinder represent its member variables. Um, you know, and again, uh, the noun phrase approach and you know, highlighting nouns and verbs, it's not the only possible technique. There are several uh, other object-oriented techniques. Uh, we talked a little bit about CRC and domain analysis, of course, uh, works really well. So that's the end of it. Um, let's uh, check back and we'll get a little bit more into uh, dynamic memory next time. Thanks for watching.